Since the fall of man, a war has raged between good and evil. Over the centuries, this war has distorted the truth. Now the truth is perceived as lies, and lies acknowledged as truth. To this day, the battle continues as we investigate and debate the truth behind the history and mystery of the universe. We are Paratruth Radio. For centuries, men and women have explored deserts, jungles, and ancient ruins in hopes of finding evidence of the ancient beings known as the Nephilim. Many have claimed to find such evidence, some of which was falsified, others unidentified, and still others that have been deemed legitimate. Today, we continue our search for answers as we find our way back on the trail of the Nephilim. Now Paratruth presents Trailing the Nephilim, Part 2, with special guest, L.A. Marzulli. What's going on, Para fans? Welcome to another episode of Paratruth Radio. Uh, my name's Justin, and I am happy to announce that I have my co-host back. What's up? I'm glad to be back. It's been a while. Yeah. And now I get to, get to hang out for a couple of weeks here before getting back to work. Oh. So uh, everything has been going well on the films, yes? Yes, indeed. It has been. Uh, it's been it's been a long, long couple of months. Actually, it's weird because it's been really fast. Because, uh, you know, when you keep busy, the time just kind of flies. Yep. But at the time, same time, it feels like it's just been a really long couple of months. And if you guys uh, want to know anything, revert back to our time perception episode. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which is interesting because actually I was talking to some friends uh, this yeah, it was past Friday about the whole time thing. And, and in particular, in regards to space and the further you get out uh, in regards to light years, time begins to change. So if we had the ability to... Uh, what's the word? Um, like the speed jump? Oh. Like, what was, what's the word they use in uh, Star Trek? Uh, light speed. Okay, so go light speed, basically. Um, if we were able to do that and move from here to, say, we'll just say two billion light years out, it might only take us a year to get there and a year to come back. That'd be two years. And yet, the current generation and maybe several generations after that would already have passed away here on earth because the time is completely different out there than it is here. And I'll tell you, trying to explain that to somebody is really difficult because even I myself don't fully believe it because I've never witnessed it. (laughs) But based on what we call science and you know, you and I aren't the biggest of science guys. Right. Um, and this is coming to like, investigating paranormal stuff <laughs> but um <laughs> it just doesn't make sense but it's weird because it, it at the same time it does make sense when you actually start to think about it and think about like the whole black hole type thing and how time warp happens but, and it's funny that you bring up the black hole thing because i don't think i even asked you did you see the article about uh nasa seeing something coming out of a black hole did i see it <laughs> Justin, I'm ashamed. I can't believe you would even question. <laughs> of course I saw it. And it, that's, that's another thing we talked about because, you, you know, for years there's always been the speculation. And, of course, there's been uh, or have been claims that we had photos of a white hole as well. And mm-hmm. that basically on one side you got the black hole and then whatever the wormhole is in between. And then the white hole is where all the light comes out of. And so the find or catch a picture get a picture to and catch something coming out of the black hole is really interesting and weird considering the gravitational pull shouldn't allow that which has us question i think anyway whether a black hole though for many years scientists said that they only get bigger and stronger as they go can actually end up weakening at some point 
and losing its gravitational pull. Mm. Um, which is really kind of crazy to think about and kind of cool, though, because it's like it, it just completely disrupts all the original science that, that scientists claim to have uh, or evidence, I should say, that uh, scientists claim to have had supporting their theories. Right. Well, okay. Well, that's our rabbit trail for right now, guys. <laughs> that was quick. Yeah. That was real quick. Um, so we do have a, uh, a good show for you. We are once again having on L.A. Marzulli to continue his uh, On the Trail of the Nephilim series. He We kind of pretty much covered part one. We're going to delve into part two, and there's so much more information just in part two, uh, part one was pretty cool because I actually got to see that uh, there are these uh, supposed Nephilim mounds in Ohio, where I'm from and Eric is from, and uh, so it just piqued my interest to to delve a little deeper. And uh, so we are going to have Ellie on again, and uh, we actually we'll have him on one more time in December to talk about his newest book Days of Chaos which is kind of ties uh, a little bit of the the Nephilim into uh, what's going on right now uh, as well as just numerous amounts of other information so I won't touch base on that until we get to that show uh, so I think it is time to go to the line with L.A. Marzuli. All right, L.A., welcome back to Paratruth Radio. How are you? I'm really good. Thanks for having me on, guys. Great to be here. All right. So as we kind of wrapped up last week, we started to delve into the Seed War and uh, talked a little bit about how uh, it's believed that the Nephilim are still here now. We talked about uh, the the um, elongated heads. We talked about uh, you guys starting to get into DNA research for this as well. Uh, one thing I wanted to, to start out with uh, is with the elongated heads. Do you feel that uh, with the elongated heads, they are somehow connected to uh, the extraterrestrial phenomenon we have going on right now? Absolutely. I, I, think, I think that there is a, a definite connection um, between the, the elong- what we see in, in um, let's say the ancient world, and and these skills, uh, these skulls, these skills, these uh, <laughs> artifacts in Paracas have been definitely carbon dated uh, to over to two thousand years old and older. So what I think is a definite connection between what happened in antiquity and of course what is happening now in modernity. I, I think it goes back to the Genesis three biblical prophetic narrative, which basically states that there's going to be a seed war, and this is why that that passage of scripture is so totally important to understand right right from the get-go. In other words, unless we um, unless we come to grips with with what's going on in in the prophetic um, biblical you know biblical prophetic narrative back in Genesis three, we have no idea uh, that there's a seed war which is manifesting open manifesting openly on the planet, and has done so through the ages. There are those who tell us, well, there was only one incursion. That's it. Where does it say that? It doesn't. There, there's no caveat that says, well, you guys can only screw around once. No, it says the seed of a serpent will be at enmity with the seed of the woman. And we know that the seed of a serpent eventually culminates in the rise of the anti-Messiah, the one instead of the Messiah, uh, the Antichrist, um, the spawn of Satan. That's what it is, in my opinion. And there's no way around that. I mean, we, we can try to you know, fudge and tap dance and pretend it's not there. But in my opinion, it is, and unless we come to grips with it and understand what we're talking about here, the severity of it, and also come to grips with the fact that we don't really get a good overview of what the protocols, as Gary Stearman would call them, of this heavenly war really are. We get glimpses of it through Scripture, in Daniel, for instance, um, in Revelation we get a little bit, but we don't understand it. We don't understand how the game is really being played, because it is a cosmic chess match between the Most High God um, and a created being, Hasatan, Satan. That's all we know. Um, but we don't know the particulars. We don't know, can you do this, can you not do this? We get a glimpse of it in the book of Job, where, I mean, this is crazy. But I believe the book of Job is the field manual for the Christian, because the book of Job shows us what the enemy is capable of doing. But remember, when Satan goes in front of, of, of uh, the, the heavenly court, which is what it is, 
um, or as, Mar- as Heiser would call it, divine council, but he's there in a heavenly court, a heavenly situation. Somehow he has access to the throne room. Go figure. How does that work? And I mean, you know, the mind reels at this. We, we really don't understand all the particulars. And to consider my servant Job, right, this whole thing. And it goes on from there. And there's this there's interplay between the Most High God, Elion, and the fallen cherub. Well, he only worships you because you do all this stuff for him. This is... This should be required reading for every Christian on the planet at least once a year because the enemy is allowed to do only certain things to Job and then only without uh, a specific permission from the Most High God. Well, you can you can extract them a sickness, but you won't kill them. You know, you can do this, this, and this. And, there, and you say, why would God allow it? God allows it, and it's part of our canon, part of our scripture, to give us, it should be our field manual for spiritual warfare because it gives us a glimpse into what the enemy is capable of doing and what he's, when it says and later on you know, Satan comes to rob, kill, and destroy we need to hold on to those scriptures and understand that that's not an understatement or it's not an overstatement I should say, it's not an overstatement rob, kill, and destroy, that's exactly what he intends to do and the book of Job spells that out with great specificity so we get a glimpse of what is happening all throughout scripture of some of these protocols, but we don't get all of them. So getting back on track here, the idea that these elongated skulls and somehow can tie into what we're seeing in modernity with the abduction phenomenon and these hybrid beings, the enemy, the fallen cherub, has been trying to create man in his own image. We have gotten several reports from people who have claimed to have encounters with what we would call hybrid beings. Um, They look human, they act human, but they're not human. And um, I think last time we talked about uh, Pastor Mike's encounter with one. If we didn't, I'd be more than happy to share that with you. Okay. Yeah, uh, let's let's go into that a little bit. Pastor Mike was out um, doing what's like a prayer walk. He's out in the uh, in like a park, and he's you know just like a, a Saturday, whatever. He's walking around. It's a nice sunny summer day, and uh, you know he's just praying for people and situations and things. That's what pastors do. That's mm-hmm. what Christians should be doing constantly. You know, being being in prayer. I mean, not every second of the day. I get it. But, you know, Paul admonishes us to pray without ceasing, and and that's uh, obviously if we're we're at work, it, it's difficult to do. But the thing is, we can we can surface from time to time, even while uh, while tasking. We can even now, as I'm talking to you, I can be sending out like a signal. Father, bless this interview. Just like. You know, I can break off from this and just give it to the Lord type of thing. So, mm-hmm. you know, and, and it's a discipline. We have to train ourselves to do that. And the Spirit of the living God will train us to do that. So that's what that's what Mike is doing. He's on this prayer walk. He's praying. In the distance, he sees a female jogger. She's very tall, athletic, 6'3", six, 6'4", six, nothing unusual about that. I mean, bas- women basketball players are that tall, and frankly, women who aren't basketball players are yeah. that tall. Yeah. So, you know, it's just, okay, we got a, we got a tall a lady there, so and she's very athletic and she's jogging. Again, nothing unusual about it. But her hair is strikingly blonde. It's almost whitish. And that sort of makes Mike, you know, do a double take because it just it's it's almost translucent. It's like platinum blonde hair. Mm. Uh, strikingly you know, so. And and Mike when he sees her, instantly his hackles are up. His spiritual hackles are up. He feels that something isn't right, not sure what it is. As she gets closer, they make eye contact. At this point, he's in prayer. She's got very pale blue eyes. And he's praying against, not sure what it is, but he's praying against it because he can feel it. And it's coming. And it's, it's he's equating it with this woman jogger. And as she comes closer, her eyes, her pupils go from jet, you know, pale blue to jet black completely black 100 percent black at this point mike who has you know dealt with this kind of stuff before immediately takes a defense offensive position and begins to verbally rebuke this being out loud you know none of your curses will alight against me or my family you foul and unclean thing that type of thing he's rebuking this thing and as she runs by him she turns and growls and bares her teeth. Now, that's chilling. Yeah. And if it is a hybrid, and I have every reason to believe that it is a hybrid, then what we witness uh, is the integration of these beings, or the beginning of the integration of these beings into society. And this is precisely what Dr. Jacobs' new book discusses, and I, I think we're in this window 
uh, where it's happening. Hmm. Hmm. Now, <clears throat> would you say then that the Antichrist, as is mentioned throughout the scriptures, and in particular the Revelation, uh, would have to, would either, could be or would have to have some sort of blood of the Nephilim in order to be the true Antichrist? I know there's a lot of speculation out there that you know Nephilim do still exist to this day, that there are hybrids out there that Satan is creating, and that the Antichrist that will come uh, is going to have to have some sort of Nephilim blood because it's the one being or creature that just, other than Satan himself, truly opposes God's creation. Well, again, what I believe is that you know you say Nephilim blood. Remember Nephilim are the progeny of the fallen angels and mm -hmm. the women of earth. The Antichrist is the direct seed of the serpent. Just like the seed of the woman um, manifests with the, uh, the Messiah, the seed of the serpent, the sperm, the genetic information of the fallen cherub manifests in the Antichrist. Don't ask me how that works. I have no idea. There's a term that Russ Dizdar taught me. It's called metaschismatoside. And what that means is that these entities have the ability to appear as anything. Um, I have no idea how they can do that. But we know, for instance, that, uh, again, from the biblical prophetic narrative, that Satan can appear as an angel of light. Mm -hmm. So that's not a true appearance. That's not what he looks like. Apparently, apparently, in scripture, he's called, one of his names is the dragon. Is that really what he looks like? We have no idea. We don't know, uh, which is maddening, quite frankly, because, you know, we're given some things, but we're not given the total the total picture. Right. And so right. it's, uh, yeah, we can speculate. And I, I love that some of these people go, oh, you know, you're not supposed to speculate. Away. The Bible is blah, blah, blah. You know, it's like, come on, guys. It's like, <laughs> I get it. You know, we're not trying to write anything new. We're trying to figure out what's already there. Yeah. You know, we're right. not trying to add to something. We're trying to figure out how does this thing come down? And that's why we're discussing it. We're not trying to add anything or, or you know, fudge something in. We know that it says, you know, the, the seed, the son of perdition. That seems to be offspring to me, which you read about in Second Thessalonians, the son of perdition. So is it the seed of a serpent? In my opinion, it is. It goes back to Genesis 3, uh, biblical prophetic narrative. It states the seed of the serpent will be at enmity at war with the seed of the woman. It's a seed war. Um, and I just think it, it's perhaps it's already happened. Perhaps it's already manifested. Perhaps this guy is already walking on the planet, giving orders to a, uh, a secret dark cabal of people, um, and that would not surprise me in the least. I've said this numerous times because there, there's no timeline as to when these things are truly happening. We can try and break it down the best we can, but it, it's only up to, to one person to figure that part out, and he's up in heaven. So one of the things that... Uh, <laughs> brings brings well said <laughs> <laughs> one thing that you know comes to mind is you know we've had so many different people that have been named the the antichrist over sure. the, the centuries uh do you think that there have been multiple antichrists or is it just building up to the true one i think that they are types okay. of, of of the antichrist okay um and I, I think that that's a fair, you know, assessment of of, of what of what what it really is. Um, you know, there are like Nero would be a type of antichrist. Right. Hitler could certainly be a type of antichrist. Um, Antiochus Antiochus of, of, of Epiphanes uh, certainly could be, you know, a, a type of antichrist. And so, um, you know, this is these are types. It's not the one. But they are certainly anti-Messiah. They are they are they are they're a type of antichrist. They're they're sort of a harbinger, if I can use that word, of what is coming, and all that makes perfect sense to me. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, would you say then? I mean, this, I, and not that would you say, but would it be a possibility then? We were just talking about how uh, Satan is trying to create, you know, this other type of people. You know, he 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 wants to replace God in a sense. Would it be possible then that these other so-called antichrists are possibly failed attempts of what he was trying to do and he's just kind of using them and putting them out there and as he sees them fail he tries to rework all the little mechanics uh, of his creation until he finally does get to the point where you know he it, it's his seed that becomes the full-blown antichrist and really 
brings war upon the earth. Uh, Again, that, that's yeah, that that's a very interesting um, you know conversation, and people have bandied that one about. Mm -hmm. uh, there's there's talk that the fallen cherub always has to have someone waiting in the wings because he doesn't know. On the other hand, why why that's that's sort of a, a colorful way of taking a look at it. Another way of taking a look at it would be this: that um, that uh, when and here's my biblical proof text for this. When Yeshua, when Jesus goes up to the man of the tombs, the, the, the uh, possessed demoniac uh, at Gadara, and who are you? Legion, we are many, right? Mm -hmm, right. And they say something to him which is very peculiar. They, they make a statement which, which um, begs our further scrutiny because they say, well, you know, it's not our time. Uh, we're not ready to go back in the pit. Now, I'm paraphrasing here, but that's what they say. Right. Hey, it's not our time. Wait a minute. I've written about this in the Cosmic Chess Match. Just time out here. Time out. What do you mean? It's you're it, you know you're not you're not ready. <laughs> you know it's it's not time yet. How do you know what time it is? How do you right. know it's not time for you to go to the pit? I mean, wait a minute here. What? Who? How are you somehow privy to that information? How is that possible? Yet it is. Because they know, hey, this isn't our time. It's not our time yet. doesn't look like the way it, we were told it's going to look like. Nope, can't send this to the pit. I mean, this is what I'm talking about, the protocols of the heavenly war. And the whole time-space continuum thing comes into play here. Time is an illusion. It is. We know from, from again, the biblical prophetic narrative that God sits outside of time. If, if we were ever to attain a speed of light, time wouldn't exist. God is light. Now, I don't know how any of this works. All I know is that when Yeshua is on the earth, when Jesus is walking around, he knows stuff that happens ahead of time, and he calls it out constantly, and it blows the disciples' mind. Proof text right. for this would be uh, triumphal entry. Okay, here, guys, go into the city. When you when you take the cult, and the guy comes running out and go, hey, where are you going with my donkey? Say, the master has need of him. I mean, that's that's... You know, there's no humor in the Bible, right? Are you kidding me? <laughs> That's like someone going to a 7-Eleven, you know, and, and there's a Lexus in the parking lot with the keys in it, the motor running, and you <laughs> hop in and the guy comes running out, hey, where are you going with my brand new Lexus? Oh, the master's got need of it. Nothing to worry about. Oh, <laughs> yeah, no problem at all. Just, you know, I get it. Take take the car. Baloney. Are you kidding me? But there's no humor in the Bible. How does, you, how does Jesus know that there's a donkey park there? How does he know? I mean, how how is that possible? Does he to you know? Does he send? Is he can be in two places at once? I mean, I have no clue. Right. It's just right. that he's God, and he d demonstrates that he's God. So right. you know, some of this stuff is like really you know creepy in a way. It's like where where are we? Where are we really? What is really going on on this planet? And frankly, we don't know. I right. mean, all we know is that things, in my opinion, these are the days of chaos. We are ramping up to some sort of a uh, an event which is absolutely unprecedented, the time of Jacob's trouble. I, I believe we're in that window of time. Um, I think things are accelerating. Events are accelerating towards this. That's why I blog constantly. That's where we're building our new TV studio. And for those of you who are listening, thank you so much for contributing because we are, we've are we started construction. Um, tomorrow is the first. We are actually breaking ground tomorrow. And uh, we're excited because we hope to get up and running here uh, sooner than later, maybe even before Christmas, uh, because we've got the money and, and we're, you know, pedal of the metal here. It, it's We're going for it. And the reason why we're doing it, and I think the reason why the Lord is blessed, uh, the blog is good. But video is better, and video is king, and uh, mm -hmm. that that's where we're going with this. Daily updates, the whole deal. So, you know, getting back on track here, um, if the Antichrist is here, and I believe he may be, then there's a group of people who are already doing his bidding, guaranteed. He just doesn't show up and go, ta-da! <laughs> uh, you know, there's, there's a group of people that know who he is. We, we actually talked to Chris Blake about this in Watchers 5. And Chris Blake said, you know, looked at me very casually. They, they already know who he is. Just like that. Oh, they already know who he is. Now, that's his intel and his information based on his former boss. And that was just a riveting interview in Watchers 5. So um, there you go. <laughs> All right, folks. I think we're going to take our first break here. You've been listening to Paratruth Radio with our guest, L.A. Marzuli. We will be right back after Eric's Random Fact of the Day. Now, Eric's Random Fact of the Day. 
Did you know that not everyone agrees on when the first Thanksgiving took place? According to facts.randomhistory.com, the famous pilgrim celebration at Plymouth Colony, Massachusetts in 1621 is traditionally regarded as the first American Thanksgiving. However, there are actually 12 claims to where the first Thanksgiving took place. Two in Texas, two in Florida, one in Maine, two in Virginia, and five, yes, five in Massachusetts. This was Eric's Random Fact of the Day. All right, folks, welcome back to Paratruth Radio. My name is Justin. And I'm Eric. And we've been speaking to L.A. Marzulli about his book, On the Trail of the Nephilim, Part 2. Now, Eric, I know that you have the first question of the mm-hmm. second part of our interview here. Yes. Uh, now, the one thing you said, L.A., before we went to break, you had mentioned about, you know, just how is it possible that Christ was able to know the future? You know, how could he know such a thing? He can't even fathom it. Now, I've met numerous people who claim or believe that you know Christ isn't God you know he isn't the son of God but instead he's just a prophet and in today's new age you know type of uh, type of world that he was just a psychic or a medium the very thing that the Bible speaks against that God himself speaks against just in your own view and opinion can you can you maybe just give us a little inside uh, as to what you think or what you would say to those people? Well, again, according to the biblical prophetic narrative, and this is this is where people will say, I was in, in a dialogue with this Muslim guy who starts off going, well, the Bible isn't true because Satan rewrote it. Well, mm-hmm. says who? Now, if you give him that, then then he's won the argument. But, you know, you why don't you prove to me how he was able to do that? And, of course, it's all hearsay. He was told that, but there's no proof there anyway. And what we've got is we've got... Uh, manuscripts and fragments from manuscripts that go back clear that clearly go back to the first century. So you know that's just nonsense. But the way I would do it would be this: there's a, a prophetic thread all through the biblical narrative, which talks about what happens when the Messiah will come and what happens um, at his death, and that is portrayed only by one person on this planet. Uh, we've got the prophecy of Daniel. Now this is what's interesting. The, the Muslims can say that the, the Bible was rewritten. Well, we've got the Septuagint, which is there, okay? We've mm-hmm. got that. And, you know, it, it's, and it was written before Jesus ever came on the scene. And we've got the book of Daniel, which tells us precisely when Messiah will come. And there's no way around that. He says from the time that the decree goes out to rebuild the temple until Messiah, there'll be 490 years, 77 weeks. That, I mean, that, that's basically what it is, okay? So it's, it's, it's the prophecy of the weeks, and it adds up to 490 years. And so we know precisely when that decree from Cyrus uh, was given to Nehemiah to go and rebuild the temple. It's that that stele is sitting in the British Museum for crying out loud. So you can just go there and look at it. There it is. You know, if you can read uh, cuneiform, good luck. Then you can read it for yourself. <laughs> but the bottom line is, the Jews knew. All they had to do is just keep track of a the time. They didn't. So again, going back into that 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 illustration where Jesus tells the disciples to get the cult, he's saying that because this is the triumphal entry, and he's mm-hmm. going in because he is the Messiah. So that's the first thing, and that was written in the Septuagint hundreds of years, you know, well, let's put it this way, scores of years before the advent of Messiah. So we know that that's intact. We know it's there. That hasn't been changed in thousands of years, literally. So that completely um, annihilates the idea that somehow this was rewritten and all this other nonsense. It's just it's ridiculous, totally ridiculous. Then we've got the supernatural prophetic thread, which talks about the advent of Messiah, where he'll be born. There's a whole list of prophecies that are only fulfilled by the Messiah, by Yeshua. Just him, that's it. You know, the, the tribe uh, of Judah, I mean, born in Bethlehem. Um, you know, he'll, it just goes on and on and on, uh, the prophetic implications of this. And so, you know, that's why 
if you know prophecy and you can point to the prophecies, you know, the suffering Messiah, the idea of being crucified, the idea of his his, his garments are ripped in half, not one bone is broken. Um, his, his, his garments are are, are uh, sold for 30 pieces of silver. He's betrayed by one close to him. You know, he's, he's crucified with robbers, but buried in a rich man's tomb. All of it, I mean, just those prophecies surrounding the Messiah's death alone are absolutely unbelievable. Mm-hmm. And of course, you know, skeptic, well, that was written after the fact, blah, 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 blah. Oh, really? No, they weren't. Those prophecies are all in the Old Testament or in the Tanakh. They're just fulfilled in the New. They're talked about in the New Testament. But even the disciples didn't understand those prophecies. So the other thing I would point the skeptic to is the Shroud of Turin. Because the Shroud of Turin, in my opinion, is God's calling card. That's what it is. It's God's calling card. And the Shroud of Turin, when we t- covered this, I think, in Watchers 3 or 4, when we sat down with Dame Isabel Pixek, who's a particle physicist and has studied the Shroud all of her life, and also uh, the Right Honorable uh, Barry Schwartz, who was knighted uh, for his work and f- f- uh, uh, photographic work on the Shroud, which is absolutely phenomenal. I mean, absolutely phenomenal, stellar photographs uh, of the Shroud. It's not a painting. There's no way. There are no brush strokes. There is, there is no paint that creates this image. It's, it's, it's done uh, perhaps in a very um, a burst of light, a, a singularity, a, an event horizon, a, 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 a literally a rent in the time-space continuum as we know it, where the body is laying in the tomb uh, and it is levitated because space, time, and gravity as we know it cease to exist in that area. The body dematerializes. The shroud is pulled taut. Why the body is floating above uh, the the tomb, which is why in the shroud you you don't see any indentations of the buttocks and the shoulders where you would see if the if the if the if the man in the shroud was lying uh, on on that slab there'd be indentations of the buttocks and there'd be indentations in the shoulders we don't see any of that the body is perfect the contour is perfect and we we have two images on the shroud, a frontal and dorsal image. It's absolutely profound. Uh, Just even a cursory study of the shroud um, begins to make someone who's intellectually honest and doesn't have an axe to grind, who's open-minded, they'll look at this and they'll they'll start to go, oh my gosh, what am I looking at here? But, you know, it's interesting that so many people are arrogant and ignorant. They think they know, oh, the shroud, blah, 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 blah. Ah, that, that, that's just, uh, you know, that, that's a 14th century forgery. Wasn't that proven? See, they don't know anything about what they're talking about. They've never kept up with it. And that the, the, the carbon dating has been proven to have been manipulated and to have been false. We know that. And there was a documentary in 2005 on the History Channel, which which basically showed that uh, pretty much, you know, inconclusive or conclusively that uh, the carbon 14 dating was 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 fudged. It came from an area, only one area of the shroud, where the poor sisters of Clare, after the 15th century fire, had what is done uh, a technique known as, as as blind splicing or, or blind reweaving into the shroud, and mm-hmm. they were able to take and, and create end to end splices. Um, this technique is was, was done in the Middle Ages, but it, you know I'm sure they can do it today. But it's a very uh, very unique technique, um, and, and it's blind. You know, uh, splicing like this, you you can't tell where the weave, <clears throat> the original weaves, uh, left off and the patch begins. It's just incredible. And so they they rewove certain sections of the shroud. Well, this has been proven uh, that uh, the shroud is linen. The cotton, the fibers that are in the reweave job were found in the sample, thus skewing the carbon fourteen dating to the fifteenth century, which is why it came back that you know fourteenth, fifteenth century. Oh, the skeptic goes shroud. Shroud is a, is a fake. Meanwhile, uh, a million pound donation was given to Oxford University for proving the shroud was a fake. Isn't that interesting? Mm-hmm. So, going back to uh, what we had kind of ended part one with, uh, you had mentioned DNA testing for for the Nephilim uh, and how you were on the trail and you guys were doing the DNA testing. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, first of all, um, we have really done no DNA testing from anything that's come out of Peru. Um, that Those samples were taken by the late Lloyd Pye, I believe, in 2013, 2012. Mm-hmm. We have had access to those samples, um, or the, the results of those testing of the samples, I should say. And uh, the mitochondrial DNA came back that it was neither... Um, 
human, Homo sapiens sapien, uh, Denisovan, or Neanderthal. It was something completely different. Um, we have access to a artifact, a very large skull from Peru, elongated, very elongated, in a private collection in the United States. And we were able to go in and take uh, mitochondrial, well, I should say, take DNA sampling. Um, and what's interesting here is that the uh, the mitochondrial DNA came back five. We did five different tests, including two teeth. The mito came back different in all five tests. The geneticists are going. We have no idea what we're looking at. So we're no further along than when we were 18 months ago, uh, trying to figure out what this thing is. Good news is we think we're getting closer uh, to being able to go down. But, you know, we don't know yet, and uh, it's a very long, arduous process to get permission. Once we do get permission, and I think we're going to get it, uh, we'll go down with a team. We'll take multiple DNA samples from different artifacts uh, at different places. And uh, we've got a, a, a several labs which will be working on these, and, uh, you know, we will publish the results the moment we get them. So for those that, um, you know, there are those that believe that it's not it's not uh, fallen angel DNA. It's extraterrestrials coming and, and mating with humanity compared to the, the fallen angels. How How is it proven or maybe disproven that it's not extraterrestrial, that it's something else? Well, it's not it's not proven or disproven one way or the other. All we know, we, we look, we can agree on this. Um, that there's an outside agency that's manipulating the human genome for its own its own ends. Mm. Uh, Dr. David Jacobs and I have nothing in common um, in our in our worldviews. Um, he's an ardent. I would assume he's an ardent Darwinist. Um, I'm not, I'm much. I can't say. You know, I can't put words in his mouth. But I know he doesn't believe in the supernatural. I don't believe so. I know he doesn't believe in a in the God of the Bible per se. Um, but that's fine. Uh, we agree that whatever these entities are, that they are manipulating the human genome for their own end. Mm -hmm. So there's agreement there. <clears throat> I mean, even though we're disparate, perhaps, in our worldview, right. <laughs> how we see the world, we can look at the phenomenon of the abduction, um, of the, the so-called alien abductions, the breeding program, the UFO, um, UFOs, which are seen everywhere, and we can come to agreement and say that, wow, something is going on here, which is unprecedented. There is an outside agency that is, in fact, manipulating the human genome. And when he says extraterrestrial, I can agree with him. Because in a classic sense, anything from not, from that's not from this planet is an extraterrestrial. Right. Um, Jesus, in, in one way, would be an extraterrestrial. Any, any angelic encounter, in the classic sense, any angel that comes here, an angel just means angelos from Latin messenger, that's what it means, mm. is in fact an extraterrestrial. This is not their home. Um, I am a terrestrial being. I was born here, as far right. as I know. Right. <laughs> okay, and so were you guys. But an angel coming here is, is, in a classic sense, an extraterrestrial. So when you really come down to it, we're really not that far apart. Really not that far apart. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm going to change the topic a little bit here. Um, you were talking about the elongated skulls in regards that these elongated skulls are possibly Nephilim uh, skulls and bones. Uh, one thing that I know has come up many years ago, Justin and I have talked about this numerous times back in 2012, but it's the whole idea or belief of these crystal skulls that people claim to find. And the one thing that's interesting about some of these uh, crystal skulls is that they too have an elongated head. Do you think that these crystal skulls are for some reason part of the whole, uh, I guess, and I'm not even sure what I'm looking for, but part of like the whole Nephilim thing, you know, are, are they, is this something that maybe the Nephilim created up themselves? Is this something that was created by humans to, uh, almost as if to worship these things, as if the Nephilim were their gods? What are your well, thoughts? My thoughts are simply this, that these entities are worshipped as gods. Mm -hmm. The Nephilim would be the superhumans that we read about in, in Greek mythos. Hercules is, is a classic example of a Nephilim, and that's what he would be. Remember, it's fallen angels mating with the women, creating a hybrid known as a Nephilim. They are um, 
uh, demonic. They are in a fixed state. They are irredeemable. They are the soulless ones. Um, they are highly malevolent and evil. Uh, and perhaps they had elongated skulls. Many of them did. Some of them do not. Um, again, there's different breeding that's going on. But we see elongated skulls pretty much everywhere, all over the planet. Uh, there's, a, there's an interesting book by Maria Wheatley, which I just finished reading, which talks about elongated, get this, guys, elongated skulls being found, guess where? In Stonehenge. Mm, wow. Yeah. And see, this is what I'm talking about. This all gets back into the idea of fallen angel technology and Nephilim architecture. And with that in mind, we believe that these these entities, when they do manifest here, they are worshipped by by normal humans as gods. They would appear as gods of little g. They, they have superhuman power and intellect, and they're able to do who knows what, levitate objects, read your mind, um, you know, you name it. And uh, this is what we think happened uh, in the far distant past and antiquity. And when they come again, this race of hybrid beings will show the same type of um, supernatural power, in my mm-hmm. opinion. All right, folks, we are going to take our second break and take a listen to Justin's Paranormal Headlines. And now, Paratruth Radio's Paranormal Headlines. How's it going, Parafans? Justin here with your Paranormal Headlines. These headlines are from AlteredDimensions.net. It's a live, weird video shows the Earth breathing. We've all been taught that the Earth is alive, and here's some pretty freaky footage proving just that. This unusual video appeared online a few days ago and appears to show the Earth breathing. In all likelihood, the effect is due to wind, loose waterlogged Earth, or possibly water underneath the ground surface, or a combination of both. Whatever the cause, I'd suggest nobody go and poke it. The video was rumored to have been shot in a forest in Nova Scotia on October 31st, 2015 by Brian Nuttall. Newly discovered SOS distress telegram from Titanic proves owner's new ship was in distress and sinking. White Star Line, owners of the Titanic ship, have long refuted hearing anything from the sinking Titanic on the day it sank. In fact, Philip Franklin, the head of White Star Line, swore an oath to a U.S. congregational hearing swearing he had not received any word from the ship after it struck an iceberg that drove it to the bottom of the North Atlantic Ocean, claiming the lives of 1,523 passengers and crew. Today, a distress telegram from the Titanic has been revealed and is up for auction. The desperate message sent via communications company Western Union reads, To Mr. P.A. Franklin, White Star Streamship Company 9, Broadway, New York City, CQD, CQD, SOS, SOS. From MGY, RMS Titanic, we have struck iceberg, sinking fast, come to our assistance. Position latitude 41.46 north by longitude 50.14 west, MGY. The historic document has been unknown for 103 years until it was listed for auction by a seller who inherited it from his cousin, a collector of antique radio and telegraphic equipment. The documentation that came with the telegram only goes back 20 years. It was found in an envelope from 1988 bearing the written message, this is 86 years old. Heritage Auctions has verified the authenticity of the document. It is not known when the SOS telegram was sent, but experts have long believed that White Star Line bosses would have known that the Titanic was sinking. Previously, Franklin had vehemently claimed that the only news he received came from Bruce Ismay, the general manager of the White Star Line, who had been on board the Titanic, but was saved by the rescue ship, the Carpathia. According to one expert, we can't 100% say that Franklin saw this telegram, but its emergence challenges his claim that no message was sent to White Star Line. The unsinkable Titanic, the world's biggest passenger liner at the time, left Southampton, England for New York on its maiden voyage on April 10, 1912. It struck the iceberg near Newfoundland at 11.40 p.m. on April 14, 1912, and sank around 2.20 a.m. on April 15th. 
It is not known exactly how many telegraphs were sent from the Titanic after it struck the iceberg because the log was destroyed when the liner sank. However, it's known that at the very least, they sent out telegrams to the different postal services once they realized that the mail they were carrying would be delayed or undelivered. There are believed to be about a dozen authentic telegrams in existence, but this is the only known one sent from Titanic directly to White Star Line. And this has been Justin with your Paranormal Headlines. This was a segment of Parachute Radio's Paranormal Headlines. Folks, welcome back to Paratruth Radio. My name is Eric. And I'm Justin. And if you're just tuning in, well, shame on you. We are, we are currently... <laughs> I love how we, we shame our listeners every time. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, we love you guys. We do. We actually do. We've had some amazing <laughs> emails in the past couple of weeks, so we do love you very much. Uh, uh, but if you are just tuning in, we are currently speaking with L.A. Marzulli, uh, and in particular, we're speaking about the Nephilim. Uh, the last thing we talked about was the crystal skulls and just exactly what these Nephilim are, who these Nephilim are. And whether or not, of course, are they human? Are they angelic by nature? Are they demonic? What, you know, what are they? Um, in LA, there's there's a lot of uh, I shouldn't say a lot, but there's been quite a few people who've come forward and claimed to find so-called nephilim skeletons, based on the amount of evidence that we have uh, of physical evidence that we have regarding the Nephilim how many of these so called findings would you say are true and how many perhaps are doctored or falsified I think the majority of them uh, are falsified okay. uh, I, I may, and, I, and I mean that the stuff you see on the internet is absolutely nonsense uh, for the most part in, in the book, Amateur of Nephilim, Volume 2, which, which we're talking about, um, the picture that I have there of Ralph Glidden standing in an openly excavated grave shows a nine-footer. We had that that picture analyzed by three different technicians who, who digitized the photograph, uh, put it in their, in their computers, and uh, were able to ascertain the height of that skeleton based on Ralph Glidden's height of five foot eight inches. Uh, all three researchers put it at around nine feet um you know i'm not making this stuff up and the history channel used my research on their um um uh, tv show in search of a lost giants so basically the vr brothers had nothing and that's why they used my material that's why they had me on because i did find something i found a photograph many of the photographs that may have been taken have been destroyed or confiscated in some way. Those photographs sat in a cache of records in a trunk for over 50 years, and they were discovered by the former curator of the Catalina Museum, John Borgina. And when I found out about that and was able to go and look at the cache of records and photographs, everything had been picked over. Everything was cataloged and, and put in folders and in museum boxes, and those museum boxes were kept in a vault, all right? Mm-hmm. I found the photograph, and I found three or four different photographs, one of them with the elongated skulls, right in Catalina. That's not supposed to be there, guys. Right. And all that's right. why it's all in on the trail of Nephilim Volume 2. And, you know, the bottom line is we went back to that museum eight months after the book was published and I walked in and the Ralph Gooden exhibit had been greatly reduced to basically a small room and we walked in that room and there's my picture on the wall which they've blown up and uh, they've made it look like a sepia and uh, you know they colored it so it's a sepia type thing so it looks old and it's uh, about two feet long by 18 inches high and there it is except they've cropped the giant out of the picture Mm. and i show that uh in my in my conferences 
Um, it is absolutely astounding. It is unbelievable, but there it is. And there's a picture we have where Richard Richard Shaw, my business partner and the and the director of the Watchers series, is holding the book on Trail of a Nephilim Two with my picture, and he holds it up. You know, you see his hands holding it up, and there's the picture of Ralph Gooden standing in the recently excavated tomb or grave, but the picture's been cropped. There is no giant. And then my book right underneath it, showing the picture. <laughs> with <laughs> The giant's still there. You know, who are these people? Yeah. Who are these people? <laughs> All right, L.A., we are getting close to the end of the show here, so I did uh, want to give you a chance to tell everybody where they can find you, find your books. I know Days of Chaos is coming up uh, and is, uh, I believe, is already out, correct? Yeah, Days of Chaos is out. It's selling incredibly vigorously, uh, and the reason for that, or I should say sales have been vigorous, uh, we've hit a nerve here with this book. Uh, just look at the parish shootings over the weekend. This is not going away. These are the days of chaos. Uh, some of the secular people uh, accuse me of, of, of harboring fear porn. And, you know, these are the ostrich people. That's what I've, I've named them, retaliation. You know, these are the ostrich people who just can only think about love, light, laughter, and rainbows. Meanwhile, mm -hmm. uh, you've got ISIS storming all over the planet, uh, murdering 129 people and injuring hundreds of others. Uh, and it's coming here, and it's not going away. And there's an agenda to completely create chaos everywhere. And that's what's going on, and that's um, – these are the days of chaos. You know, earthquakes, famines. Look, Jesus warns us in the last days there would be wars and rumors of wars, famines, pestilence, earthquakes in diverse places, men faint from fear, what is coming upon the earth. Folks, we are in the window of time. These are the days of chaos. Get the book, watch the video, decide for yourself. You can call it fear porn, or you can actually stand up, get your head out of the sand, you know, take your I'm an ostrich person tag and, 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 and burn it. And look at what's going on on this planet. You tell us where we're going wrong. And that's the trouble. They can't. They, you know, Madonna's talking about, all we have to do is love ISIS and they'll change. No, you are clueless, lady. You are apps. you know, you're love, light, laughter, and rainbows. That's where you're at. You're an ostrich person. You don't get what's going on. What, what, is, it, what is going on on this planet is absolutely unprecedented. And, it, and it's written with great specificity in the biblical prophetic narrative, and it is manifesting now, even as I speak. All right. And they can find everything at your website, correct? That's correct. And that is net, guys. L.A., thank you for coming on again. So much uh, information to, to uh, just ponder. And I'm looking forward to getting you on to speak of uh, the Days of Chaos. But until then, have yourself a good night, and we will talk again soon. Sounds good, man. Thanks for having me on, guys. Really appreciate it. All right. Have a good night. Uh, good night. All right, folks. L.A. Marzulli once again uh, finishing up on the Trail of the Nephilim and heading into Days of Chaos. So definitely look forward to that. Uh, uh, that will be on, on December 6th. Uh, so definitely make sure you guys uh, stay tuned for that. Uh, a lot of great stuff coming up for you guys. Next week we are speaking on Croatoan. Uh, it's going to be kind of linked to a Thanksgiving episode, even though, unfortunately, just like our Halloween episode, Justin wasn't on the ball, and it airs after Halloween, yeah, Thanksgiving. But sad. I did get on the ball, and you guys will hear our Christmas and New Year's episodes before those holidays are up. Good job, Justin. <laughs> so, it's because I haven't been around. You, you <laughs> didn't know what to do. You couldn't think straight. You're just stressing because I wasn't here to talk to you. Well, I understand. You are my yin to yang. So, Aww. So I uh, just to give everybody a heads up, uh, you have been working on other films, but you have also been uh, finishing up editing the revealed. So why don't you give everybody a uh, a update? Oh yeah. Uh, well, you just said it first and foremost. Been working on a number of different films, but yeah, I've been working on the edit um, and all the post production. You guys know this. Uh, I'm working on the fine cut right now. Basically, I have the picture set up the way I want it to be. There's a few things I'm working on. I'm working on changing the ending a little bit. Uh, honestly, what I shot wasn't exactly what I was hoping to get. So I am reworking it a little bit. 
Uh, but it's definitely going to be awesome. I've had people checking it out. I've had uh, friends of mine viewing it, getting their feedback. And you guys, I truly believe, are going to be blown away by this uh, mysterious story of the revealed. And unfortunately, that won't be coming out, as you all know, until around May, June, something like that. So there's a ways to go, a little bit of waiting. However, I can tell you, this is very important. I can tell you that there is a teaser trailer for The Revealed that is complete. 100%. And I'm going to give you guys a, just a little inside on some, the insider on something. I am debuting it tonight as soon as this show ends. I'll be posting it up on Facebook, on the Revealed page. I'll be putting it on the Pair of Truth page. I'll be putting it on my own personal page. I'll probably be posting it up on a number of other uh, friendly radio show hosts page that we know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Heads up, so, Heidi, Jerry. Mm-hmm. Kay, Kay, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> you're listening now and you're, you're going to know that you're going to be sponsoring uh, <laughs> my, my, my trailer uh, but yeah so the teaser trailer is complete I hope you guys enjoy it uh, I re- would love your feedback feel free to email us about it uh, and yeah you know I'm just really looking forward to it it's nice that we're coming up to Thanksgiving break for, for me you know I get to take a nice week off I'll be joining everybody next week as well on the show uh, for, for the Croatoan one so I'm really looking forward to that. But yeah, you know, it's going well. We're coming down to the wire here. And to answer your question, Heidi, I still truly don't know what Croatone is. So I will be doing the research. Oh, goodness. <laughs> I am surprised that I'm the one who actually knows this stuff right now. <laughs> but normally, normally it's Justin. He's like, has the one up on me, you know, knowing this stuff. And I'm like trailing behind trying to catch up. So... <laughs> So uh, it's going to be an interesting one because I, I have never done the research for it. You know, a lot of the stuff we've talked about, just Eric and myself, him and I have done the research numerous times, probably together and separately. So it's going to be an interesting one. Uh, so after that, uh, like I said, we're going to have L.A. Marzulli again. Uh, we are privileged to have Heidi on after that uh, to talk about her book, uh, Daughter of Siva. And... Um, after that, it's in the Christmas, and then our New Year's extravaganza, where we will be having, get this, guys, not one, not two, not three, not four, yeah, four, four uh, podcasts, uh, podcasters on with us, uh, ourselves, along with uh, Kay from Deception Detection Radio, Heidi and Scott from Talk Supernatural, and Justin Fall from The Fourth Watch. We're all going to be doing a uh, roundtable discussion, just a, a fun discussion, not anything where people are going to be, you know, dodging gunfire or anything like that. So uh, it's definitely going to be a whirlwind here on Paratruth Radio. A lot of stuff okay. coming up. So uh, on that note, uh, that's all we've got for you guys tonight. It's been a blast having my co host back and for next week as well so until next week same time same channel my name's justin and i'm eric and we'll talk to you guys next week peace if you enjoyed this episode of parachute radio and you would like to listen to it again or are interested in listening to any of our past episodes then you can listen to them on hd at our website parachutheradio.com And you can also find us at Stitcher, Blueberry, TuneIn, iTunes, Spreaker, and YouTube. And of course, like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter for brand new updates of our show every day. 